Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's well. Uh, so joining us in the Stampex Auditorium is Peter Congreve. He's a fourth generation philatelist and Peter is going to present the social philatelist approach to collecting postal history. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. It's lovely to have you here and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, to give this talk. Um, before we start, uh, given that tomorrow is the uh, coronation of uh, King Charles III and Queen Camilla, I couldn't let this uh, opportunity pass without a passing nod uh, to this Abbey ticket, uh, not my own, uh, to the coronation of King George IV. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this is because it was designed and printed under the direction of my third cousin, uh, five generations removed, I hasten to add, uh, Sir William Congreve, uh, using his invention of the compound plate printing press, which has a fascinating history uh, connected to the history of the penny black, uh, and which also celebrates its birthday uh, this month. Uh, although Sir William, pictured here, is probably best remembered for his rockets, uh, most famously immortalized in the US national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner as the rocket's red glare, uh, Sir William's interest actually extended to many fields of engineering, including his invention of the compound plate printing press in response to a treasury competition uh, announced in 1818 to find a means of printing banknotes that could not be counterfeited. Over the five years that followed that announcement, uh, Sir William took out a series of three patents uh, connected to the press and saw it established with the printers and engravers, Branston and Whiting, uh, and at the government printing office at Somerset House. Although Sir William uh, did not win that competition, despite being on the judging panel, uh, his press did not lie idle. Uh, and as we have seen, uh, was used uh, to print the beautifully intricately designed tickets to the 1821 coronation. In 1824, uh, Sir William handed over the patent rights to Branston and Whiting as he turned his attention to other interests. Uh, but the story doesn't end there. After Sir William died in 1828, his widow, uh, Lady Congreve, uh, Isabella, married Charles Fenton Whiting in 1835. He was a son of James Whiting, uh, a very good friend of Sir William's and one of the partners in that previously mentioned firm of Branston and Whiting. And in 1839, Charles Whiting entered another British treasury competition for the, for the design of the first postage stamps. He submitted multiple entries uh, using two processes that had been originally invented and patented by Sir William, including the compound plate printing method, as illustrated on the Smithsonian uh, Postal Museum website, which I've got up here. Unfortunately, while uh, Charles was awarded a runner-up prize of 100 British pounds, uh, the race uh, for the first postage stamp was actually run, but won by Perkins uh, of Penny Black fame. But in 1860, uh, Charles was successful uh, in bidding for the supply of stamps to Prince Edward Island in Canada, uh, but that's another story entirely and not why we're here today. Whoops, going wrong way in my presentation, my apologies. So before I continue, uh, I think it's probably a good idea to explain what this presentation is, as well as, of course, what it is not. What this presentation is not is a guide to exhibiting social philately. Uh, that's something I don't do. It's also not a guide on how to do social history or family history research. Uh, if you are interested in that second uh, point, I might direct you to read my article, which was published in the February 2021 edition of the American Philatelist, but is available now online through the APS uh, website. So what this presentation is, is my personal approach to collecting postal history, told through stories and through examples. It's an exploration of how a social and genealogical approach can provide an alternative way to collecting postal history, but which 
may also add interest, context, and value to any collection. So I'm all about the story. So let's start by looking at this cover. And my rhetorical question uh, to you is, what do you see when you look at this cover? Your first thought, if you've approached this from a postal history perspective, is probably related to number one condition. Uh, perhaps the missing stamp that might have been torn off for someone's stamp collection. Uh, you might be looking at the 1889 Tasmanian half penny stamps uh, and wondering what rate uh, they were paying, two pence. You may be looking at the 1891 uh, Launceston postal markings uh, and the Tasmanian obliterator and wondering about the usage dates. You may be wondering about the role the cover, the route the cover took, uh, and which ship may have carried it from Tasmania to the Australian mainland. Now, all of these are absolutely fascinating uh, aspects of postal history, and they tend to be at the forefront of how most uh, postal histories are written. And while I am also keenly uh, interested in the answers to these questions, they are usually secondary uh, to my first thoughts when I see any cover. Uh, and those thoughts are, who is the sender? Who is the addressee? What is the relationship between them? And why does this postal artifact, this cover, exist at all? Not all of these questions are easily answered and often cannot be answered at all, uh, but perhaps for an educated guess. But that's okay. As a social philatelist, these are the questions that keep me interested and excited about collecting and keeps me coming back uh, to a cover again and again. I've spent years coming back to a single cover on and off and finding that newly digitized information documents that shed new light to its history or that, or after that break, uh, that time away has given me a chance to look at the cover again in a fresh light, uh, leading me down new and often productive paths. In my AP article uh, reference that I referenced earlier, it was over a year after that article was published uh, that I was able to finally answer one of my unanswered questions, which I posed at the end of that article. In the case of this cover, the primary addressee was Helen Woodruff. Helen was the eldest of three girls born to the itinerant songsters, Charles Robert Thatcher, seen here on the left, uh, he was also known as the Goldfields Balladeer, uh, and her mother, the soprano, Madame Vitelli. Both were prominent personalities in colonial Australian entertainment and culture. Helen was also apparently a gifted singer as well. Whoops, sorry, I've gone back. There we go. The cover is addressed to Helen, care of Mrs. H. F. Eaton of South Yarra, a suburb of Melbourne in the state of Victoria. Mrs. Eaton was Elizabeth Davy, daughter of Dr. Edward Davy, pictured here. He was a pioneer in the development of telegraphy in the UK, but after his first marriage broke down and he found himself in litigation with his wife and her creditors, he uh, fled England uh, for Australia uh, and giving up work on the electric telegraph in the process. Nevertheless, uh, his uh, contribution is still remembered uh, to this day, uh, as seen by this Heritage Society blue plaque, which is mounted on Raleigh House in Ottery, St. Mary. Elizabeth's name on the cover uh, was written as Mrs. Henry Francis Eaton, however. And when this cover was sent in 1891, to the Eaton's Wall Street home. Henry, her husband, was under treasurer of Victoria, a position he held from 1889 until his retirement in 1895. Returning to our 
primary addressee, Helen. She was married to William Henry McKay Woodruff, pictured here. And at the time this cover was sent, she was pregnant with their third child, Ronald. The couple's first child, Dorothy, whom we shall meet again shortly, was six years old at the time. When this cover from Launceston was sent, the Woodruffs were visiting Melbourne. However, Launceston was their home. It was where William managed a branch of the Co Commercial Union Assurance Company. They had lived in Melbourne prior to the move to Tasmania, which is undoubtedly how uh, they knew the Eatons. It has not been possible to discover who sent this cover or why, but it may have been family. In 1893, just a few years after this cover was sent, the Woodruff family left Tasmania for Sydney, where William became an independent fire loss adjuster. And in 1908, he took on a partner. But the partnership was, sorry, but the partnership was dissolved uh, short of five years later by mutual consent, effective on September the 12th. Then 10 days later, at approximately 5.30 a.m. in the morning, William suffered a mental breakdown that seems to have been connected to the end of that partnership. In a savage outburst, he attacked his wife and son with an ax while they slept before slashing his own throat, arms and legs with a razor in an attempted murder-suicide. Fortunately, everyone survived. William was imprisoned and after his release, moved to New Zealand where he took up farming. He died there on December the 8th, 1919. in an apparent suicide, falling 60 feet from a building in the New Zealand city of Auckland. If only that was the end of this tragic tale, but in keeping with the idiom, the sins of the fathers visited, on the, uh, visited upon their children, one year later, after her father's suicide, on December the 21st, 1920, William's eldest child, Dorothy, shot and killed Dr. Toza DSO. Dr. Toza was a highly respected citizen. He was a veteran of the Gallipoli campaign and a first class cricketer who played for the state of New South Wales. In the subsequent trial uh, of Dorothy, in the subsequent trial, Dorothy's husband, Harold Mort, testified that since her father's suicide, Dorothy had suffered from fits of depression. He explained that Dorothy, as the eldest child, had borne the brunt of the investigations uh, leading to a nervous breakdown while the trial was pending for his attack on her mother and brother. And it was his concern over his recent, his recent state of his wife's mental health that Howard had arranged for Dr. Toza to treat her. However, during the treatment, a romance seems to have developed and remarkable letters were exchanged, uh, presented as evidence at the trial. At some point prior to his murder, Dr. Toza had told Dorothy of his intention to marry another. And in a fit of apparent jealousy, Dorothy shot him three times, once in the back of the head, once in the forehead, and once in the chest. Of course, he died immediately. She then tried to kill herself. This is Dorothy here. She was jailed, of course, and uh, was eventually released uh, in 1929, where after she returned to live with her husband and her two children. Her husband died in 1950, and Dorothy lived until 1966, aged 80. So as you can see, uh, with a little research, this outwardly poor looking cover 
uh, which does not represent anything unusual or scarce in terms of its stamps or its rates uh, or the route that it took, uh, does take on, I believe, a far greater subjective value at least. And this is my approach to collecting postal history. Consider what we lose when we remove the stamp from the cover. With the increased digitization of books, newspapers, and historical documents and records, an embarrassment of riches is now available to us through national, state, and local archives, newspaper archives, libraries, museums, and websites dedicated to providing a free access to a range of digitized texts. Ongoing, uh, sorry, online genealogic, genealogical search engines tools and records are also available to research family histories and the information being shared through these portals is expanding all the time. In my research, I use a free online websites of family search, find a grave, billion graves and government birth, death and marriage archives. This family tree of the Woodruff family showing some of the links to the people that I talked about in my presentation earlier uh, was created completely from these free online resources. In our Woodruff example, we looked at the historical riches provided by a single cover. But, and they give it, and it gives us a, a tangible link to a chapter of Australian social, cultural, and in this case, criminal history. But if we were to expand the number of postal history items under a common theme, the potential to tell a far larger social history uh, opens before us. The theme may be based on a family name, such as in my study of the Marchant family of photographers of South Australia. The theme may be a focus on the social history of a specific era or period of time. I'm constructing such a collection looking at life in 1840s and 1850s Australia, a fascinating period that saw the beginning of the Australian gold rushes. The theme may also look at a vocation, a business or a trade. I collect covers, for example, addressed to the clients of the stamp dealers Ram Gopal and Company of Alwa, India. And the reason for that, if you look closely on your screen, you'll see that one of these covers was actually addressed to my grandfather while he was living in India and collecting Indian stamps. And talking of stamp dealers, here's another collect collecting passion of mine, the trials and tribulations of Australia's uh, colonial period stamp dealers. The options are only limited by your imagination, uh, whether you focus on a single street, a town, a migrant ship, a family, a profession, building a collection that allows you to go beyond the pure postal, postal history aspect to bring life to the stories of the people and their time is an engaging and exciting additional layer that can enrich any collection. For me, a social philatelist approach to collecting postal history provides an opportunity to create storylines that link postal artifacts in a way that explores history from a unique perspective, not driven directly by a traditional textbook treatment of dates and events, but by the people and the relationships behind them. As an example, I do this through my collection of covers linked to the development of organized ornithology from 1850 to 1950. As a child, I grew up immersed in ornithology leading to this interest area. And this slide shows some of the themes that I explore in my collection, but I will illustrate this approach with just a small number of covers from that collection linked to the beginning of the American Ornithologist Union and the classification of North American birds and nomenclature. I'll begin with this 1850 cover addressed to Edward Newton from his brother Alfred at Cambridge in the United Kingdom. 
where Alfred was a student at Magdalen College. Today, Alfred Newton is widely recognized as a monumental figure in Victorian ornithology. But in 1850, when he sent this cover to his brother, he was still a student, writing eagerly to his brother on the back flap of this cover about his attempts to secure a swan sternum. It was in Alfred's rooms at Magdalen College, where this letter was likely written, that the British, Ornithologi the British Ornithologist Union, the BOU, was founded eight years later in 1858. Alfred, as a leading driver of this effort, was elected as the union's first secretary. Many years later, the three founders of America's first ornithological association, the Nuttall Ornithological Club, were beginning, were becoming, I should say, increasingly frustrated by the apathy of its members and by the recent publication of two widely adopted and often contradictory texts listing North American birds, and decided that the time had come to create a national level body modeled on the example of the BOU, made up of a select number of ornithologists who would promote the social and scientific intercourse between American ornithologists, advance ornithology in North America generally, and revise the current list of North American birds by adopting a uniform system of classification and nomenclature that would carry the authority of the union. Of the 48 ornithologists who were invited, only 21 were able to attend and they have forever become known as the founding me members of the American Ornithologist Union, known today as the American Ornithological Society. Of the 21 founders, one was Robert Ridgway, who played a crucial role in the organization, serving as its inaugural vice president and later as a president. In fact, it was Ridgway, in fact, it, Ridgway was one of the authors of those contradictory lists of North American birds that gave rise to the foundation of the union in the first place. As one of the first orders of business, the, a, the newly established AOU wasted no time in forming a committee on the classification and nomenclature of North American birds, of which Ridgway was made a key member. And in 1886, just three years later, the agreed upon new code was published. The adoption of this new classification was swift and publishers of bird guides quickly incorporated it into their publication. One such example is The Birds of North America by Jen Jacob Henry Studer who proudly proclaimed its adherence to this new classification adopted by the AOU on the front page of his guide, shown here on the screen. Pictured here are three advertising covers for that very book. And inside the cover, the third one on the bottom right-hand corner, addressed to the Democratic, a newspaper uh, published in McPherson in Kansas, we have preserved its original contents. On the left, a pamphlet advertising the book and other publications from the publisher, the Natural Science Association of America. And on the right, an 1892 form letter signed by Studer offering a $30 discount on the book in exchange for $30 of advertising in the Democrat. On the death of Robert Widgeway in 1929, Charles Wallace Richmond, pictured here, became the new associate curator of birds at the Smithsonian. Richmond had been inspired to become a professional ornithologist through a chance meeting with Ridgway when he was a teenager and he became 
Richmond's idol. He joined the AOU in 1888, and in the following year, secured his first professional appointment in ornithology as an ornithological clerk in the Division of Economic Ornithology and Mammalogy at the Department of Agriculture. The division, as I'll call it from this point forwards, was renamed the Division of Biological Survey in 1896, and it was the forerunner to the current US Fish and Wildlife Service. It was established in 1885, thanks to the lobbying efforts of the AOU, and it was headed by Dr. Clinton Hart Merriam, an ornithologist and AOU founding member. Albert Kenrick Fisher, pictured here, another AOU founding member and a future union vice president and president, was hired to help establish the new branch. Walter Bradford Barrows, seen here, a fellow of the AOU since 1883, joined the division as an assistant ornithologist in July 1886 and was responsible for preparing the division's first publication, The English Sparrow in North America. This August 1886 postcard to Barrows is from J.W. Johnson of Merriweather, South Carolina, whose report detailing the impact of sparrows on agriculture in Edgefield County was included in that first publication. Returning to Charles Richmond, he left the division when his dream to work at the Smithsonian under Ridgeway became a reality. And in 1894, he was appointed the assistant curator of birds and in 1918, the associate creator of the division. As I stated earlier, on Ridgeway's death in 1929, Richmond took over as curator, but voluntarily stepped down from that position to resume the role of associate creator shortly after in order to pursue various projects that he was unable to continue and finish in the role that he had been promoted to. Amongst these projects was a card catalog of birds, the index to the genera and species of birds, which he had commenced prior to joining the museum and which became his life's work. Like Ridgeway, he was a member of the AOU Committee on Classification and Nomenclature of North American Birds. And shown here are two covers addressed to Richmond, both postmarked South Kensington, London, the 1907 cover at the top is anonymous, but the 1916 cover beneath it bears a Sherborne's index and a Malian hand stamp of the British Museum of Natural History. I believe that both of these covers are addressed by the same hand. And that hand was Charles Davies Sherborne, whose own card index commenced in 1890 became known as the Index and Amalium, an 11 volume. 9,000 page work that catalogued 444,000 names of every living and extinct animal discovered between 1758 and 1850. The same year of our cover to between Alfred and Edward Newton. Sherborne's work is considered the bibliographic foundation for zoological nomenclature and Richmond and Sherborne shared a long correspondence, which is believed to have begun in 1902. And it was in this correspondence that they mutually developed their respective indexes. So that is a very small uh, sampling of how I've used covers in my collection to link and tell the story between Robert Ridgway and Charles Richmond who both made important contributions to the classification and nomenclature of North American birds that continues to influence the study of ornithology to this day. As additional covers come into my collection, they may expand or take us on additional branches, such as the one I showed you looking at Richmond's years with the Division of Economic Ornithology. The covers which I limit to only commercial covers as opposed to philatelic covers, dictate the history and the story that I'm telling through the senders and the addressees. 
and gives more prominence to the relationships that might otherwise become mere footnotes in a more conventional history. Finally, I'd like to wrap up this presentation with a look at slogan cancels, which provides another fascinating uh, aspect of research into our social and cultural past. Firstly, I'd like to take a look at slogan cancels uh, that, well, let me re restart that. What I'd like to say is it's easy to forget in this digital age of social media, how important postal slogans were in the past. They publicized local and regional events. They commemorated national anniversaries, sporting events, and official visits. They promoted government schemes and postal requirements. They advocated for behavioral change. They raised awareness uh, for good causes. They endorsed uh, good causes such as sponsoring a British migrant to Australia. They endorsed ideologies and they encouraged safe practices. But what these slogans failed to convey without a little research into the period in which they were authorized by the Postmaster General's Department is a social and cultural context. And what else was happening in society when these slogans uh, were authorized? Often, these slogans were just the tip of a much larger cultural iceberg. Take, for example, the V for Victory slogan. This was actually part of a much larger V campaign that the Australian Postmaster General's Department participated in during World War II, as well as the slogan, V, surrounded by the Morse code for V. The department's contribution to this campaign included eight foot high neon V signs put on top of every general post office around the country. The words V for victory was printed on all telegraph forms, including the Morse code and on all post office stationery. Four, vic four victory posters were displayed uh, in all post, offers, post offices and were displayed on the sides of departmental vans throughout the Commonwealth. And telephone girls, their wording, not mine. Um, telephone girls uh, would word, uh, would answer telephones at the manual exchanges with the words, V for victory, number please, uh, during non-peak hours. But as for that last point, uh, that one didn't last long. Uh, despite being in non-peak hours, uh, the post office soon discovered that the extra time taken up by saying V for victory uh, had a huge impact on the number of calls they were able to process per hour, uh, and they um, stopped that particular initiative uh, fairly quickly. This small sample of newspaper articles uh, that range from 1926 to 1952, uh, and those dates are completely arbitrary, uh, show that slogans were not limited to envelopes, postcards, and parcels. They were regularly talked about in the mainstream press and advertised. As one reporter wrote in the Argus, by diligently filing old envelopes, one may accumulate a running record of Australian history in an unconventional medium. And not just Australia, this would apply to any country anywhere in the world. I've seen other articles uh, from the 1930s, from that period, that shared the same sentiment. And giving the prominence of slogans in people's lives at this time, it was no wonder that such a sentiment was being reflected in the press. We've seen some examples already. Let's take a look at what collecting slogans on a theme can reveal about the changing social and cultural climate of a country over time. Let's consider the example of telephone slogans and how they reflected both local and international events. 
Australia's first slogan council, Say It By Telephone, was introduced in January 1927. This was the same slogan that had been used in Britain immediately prior to its introduction in Australia. The British postal system had used the slogan from September 26 to January 1927, while regrouping to launch a major campaign to promote the usage and home installation of telephones between 1931 and 1934, using 10 novel and Im imaginative slogans uh, as illustrated here uh, from the book Collecting Postal Slogans by the British Postmark Society and available through the excellent website maintained by the Great Britain Philatelic Society. Perhaps due to Australia's relatively small and sparsely uh, distributed population, the Australian uh, Postmaster General's Department never initiated a campaign on quite the same scale as its British counterparts or one that would match it in imagination. This next slogan that was introduced in 1932 was in store a telephone. Used nationally, except in Western Australia, there were actually two variations of this slogan, one using a single L in the word in store and the other using two Ls which raises fascinating questions about spellings and national identity. The public and the newspapers were not oblivious to the uncertainty being shown by the post office, as illustrated in this clipping from the newspaper, The Albany, in October 1939. With the advent of the handset telephone, which promised one-handed convenience operation and lower noise levels, the Postmaster General's Department in 1938 held nothing back in their creativity when they authorized the new slogan, in store, a handset telephone. This was used concurrently with the previous slogan until they were both withdrawn in late 1941. Essentially, this was as far as the Postmaster General's Department went to promote telephone usage and ownership through a national slogan program. However, as the telephone became more widely adopted at home and in public spaces, the message of the slogans shifted their focus in response to the consequent change in the needs and priorities of the post office and the nation. After the Second World War was declared in September 1939, Australia set down on the path to introduce rationing. Included in this was petrol rationing, which after numerous delays due to public and political opposition was finally passed into law in October 1940. To help promote the new law, the Postmaster General's Department introduced the postal slogan, telephone and save petrol as a practical piece of advice. While generally phased out by February 1942, the slogans continued to see some isolated usage in the years that followed. In fact, it has been recorded as late as 1973 in Mount Gambia in Australia. And the reason for its usage in 1973 may be connected to the postmaster's response to the 1973 oil crisis. With more and more public telephones being installed around the country, the next telephone related slogan, which was introduced in 1957, was an appeal to the Australian public to take care of public telephones. This slogan saw annual usage uh, until mid-1975, but the problem of vandalism of public telephones was not new. Appeals had been publicized in newspapers for over a decade by this point. And in the quote uh, that I have on the screen, in a beautiful linguistic ballet, uh, avoids mentioning the idea of vandalism, vandalism at all, but appeals to the public uh, that uh, it's only through their good use of these facilities 
that will make it available to others in a time of great emergency. Clearly, by 1957, when this slogan was authorized, the post office had, had come to the conclusion that enough was enough and that newspaper appeals was not hitting the mark. Finally, we have a listen for a dial tone slogan. As telephone exchanges were being upgraded from manual to automated services, people needed to be educated in the correct process for dialing. One of the biggest issues around this period was people beginning to dial before hearing the dial tone. And this introduced a whole host of problems. The dial tone indicated that the service was ready to receive the number. But by starting to dial before that dial tone was heard meant that only part of the number would be registered by the exchange. And as a result, the call would either not be connected or be connected to an incorrect number. This article, which was published in 1975, appeals to people in the local area of King Island about how to use the telephone. So that was a plethora of slogans that sought to influence society. But it's also interesting to look at how society also influenced slogans. In 1932, the Australian Postmaster General's Department introduced the Post Now for Christmas slogan as part of its annual post early campaign. The objective of the campaign was to get people to post Christmas mail earlier in the Christmas season. Number one, to relieve pressure on the post office system, but also to ensure that Christmas mail would be delivered on time, a source of great complaint to the post office. And as part of this program, a pictorial slogan featuring the head of Santa Claus was authorized. It was meant to be used annually in the second week of December and was distributed to general post offices in each state of Australia. To really give the 1932 campaign some extra steam, on December the 6th, a memorandum was sent to all postmasters at the GPOs to make the slogans available to the press for publicity purposes. And some of the newspaper articles as seen here on this screen uh, feature these slogans as was released to them by the local post office in order to uh, use in their newspaper articles. And these newspaper uh, clippings, as all of the clippings that I've shown in this presentation, come from Trove, which is an amazing free source of newspaper articles for Australia. The newspaper reports gave a range of starting dates for the use of these slogans. And pictured here from my collection is the earliest known cover, dated December the 10th using one of the three dies pictured on the right that was supplied to the South Australian GPO. Other than this example, the earliest known covers were dated from December the 11th from Sydney and Brisbane GPOs. The original 1932 dies of the Santa slogan of which there were 32 in number were engraved by the Melbourne firm of C.G. Rosler and Son at 30 shillings and nine pence per unit and allocated to GPOs around the country. Over the following years, additional dies were tendered for as need required by the individual post offices. But the quality of these engravings were brought into question in 1938 when letters started pouring in to the post office concerning the grotesqueness of Santa's image. This is a scan of one of the original memorandums uh, sent to the uh, chief engineer uh, saying that because of the grotesqueness of these new slogans, it's going to be necessary to arrange for replacements before the next Christmas season. 
The chief engineer, in turn, sent a memorandum to all of the post office. You'll notice that in this scan of that original memorandum, the word somewhat grotesque, uh, well, the word somewhat uh, has been uh, crossed out. Uh, so the word grotesque took prominence. And the chief engineer asked for each of the GPOs to take an imprint of every Santa slogan that was currently in use, either ones that were originally allocated to them, but also the ones that they tended for and commissioned themselves. As a result of this, uh, the GPO uh, sent, uh, reviewed the imprints and sent another memorandum to the GPOs with pictures of the slogan cancels they wanted destroyed. In the meantime, they commissioned a new slogan to take the Santa slogan place. One of these was the one that you see on your screen now, post now for Christmas. But this was ultimately rejected because it was felt that it was not typical of Australian flora during the Christmas season. The favoured slogan was the Star of Bethlehem slogan, seen here in what is, I believe, the earliest known cover for this slogan in Australia. This slogan was introduced in 1939 and it was intended to replace the Santa slogans. But as you can see here, issued on the same day, November the 27th, 1939, the post office continued to use the Santa slogans. In fact, they completely ignored to a large extent the GPO's uh, directives to destroy particular slogan slogans, uh, mainly, well, probably because uh, the, news, the GPOs uh, needed them to fill the number of printing pre cancellation uh, presses that they had, uh, and so were loathe to uh, destroy a slogan that filled one of those slots. In fact, they continued to use them until they came to the end of their natural lives, which for a slogan cancel in Australia around this period, was around 20 to 30 years, uh, depending on the uh, how often they were used. So I think that wraps up uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, just to show you uh, that last example, to show you the impact that the Australian public might have on the slogans that were used. And I hope through this presentation, by looking across at all of those different examples, I've conveyed the level or the in more in-depth level of interest that can be brought to a cover, to a slogan, or to any postal artifact through some additional research into that social and cultural aspect under which they were created and to which they were connected. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you so, so much, Peter. That was really fascinating. Um, everyone who's watching, thank you so much for attending. If you want to um, add questions for Peter in the Q&A button below or in the chat, um, please do so. He's here and he will happily answer questions. Um, if you are um, about to leave, then please do head back into the show, check out the round tables, um, head to the booth hall, meet some PTS members. Um, there's lots and lots going on. You'll also be able to re-watch Peter's talk again. In about an hour, it will be uploaded to um, the auditorium. So you can re-watch just by pressing join now at your own time, something you wanted to see again. Um, Peter, there's just a couple of comments from um, a gentleman called Nikos. He has said, um, you'll probably find you'll you'll probably find interesting a 2020 book of mine on Metastas region regime sorry slogans in middle 30s Greece it is now freely available to read through the Hellenic Philatelic F Federation has put a link I don't know if you've um I know the book and I've already it. downloaded it Excellent. I greatly appreciate that. Um, I'm well aware of the book and I have I have uh, I have downloaded it. I have uh, looked through it extensively.
Amazing. That's uh, great. Oh, he says cheers. <laughs> um, if, there's, if there's anyone else who would like to ask Peter any questions? If not, we'll say thank you so, so much, Peter. That was really, really wonderful. It was uh, brilliant to um, have you here. Great to um, hear from you. And okay, um, thank you very much. See you later. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay. Thank you very much.